You are listening to The Future of Work, Water Cooler Conversations, where business leaders share how they integrate humanity and technology to create a better workplace for today and tomorrow. This radio show and podcast is brought to you by Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center. And now let's listen in as Jen Burrell and Kyle McIntosh connect with today's valued guests. And we're back with the Future of Work Water Cooler Conversations. I'm Kyle McIntosh here with my co-host and friend, Jen Burwell, and our fascination with business leaders who have developed innovative approaches, healthy cultures, flexible workspaces, and seamless virtual technology. Today, we are excited to introduce you to Peter Adams, founder of Soul Minion Development, and Arvind Harry Haran, president of CMIT Solutions of Tempe North Chandler. I'll start first by saying, Jen, it is good to have you in person, uh, live and with a new haircut and, and uh, in the studio today. Thank you. And I don't know if it's because I'm in the studio or what, but your radio voice is on point today. So oh, oh, good. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Peter and Arvin, welcome to the show. And, and uh, we like to start the show... I know you came here to talk about business, but let's uh, let's learn a little bit about you personally first. Where did you grow up? Uh, what was it like? And how did you somehow get from there to where you sit right here today? So I grew up in, uh, in Colorado Springs and kind of got out as quickly as possible. Uh, just hit 18 and I just, I wanted out. I wanted to be somewhere else. And, and um, I remember... My mom, she was she was a single mom, just raising three boys by herself. It was it was interesting. I didn't really have the appreciation for it as I do now, but um, going away, going to college, doing my own thing, and and doing all that, and ultimately, uh, after fifteen years, uh, moving to Arizona. They were still in Colorado at the time, but moving to Arizona just to be a little bit closer. So it wasn't like a two, three day drive to, to go for a visit. Um, and I, I, I think that a lot of what I got to get where I am now came from just, you know, having my mom around, like making sure it was, it was just one of those things where very much whatever, whatever needed to happen to make sure that we were taken care of, like she made sure it happened. And I think that that, that has really kind of stayed with me um, to really just make sure that when I, when I commit to something, when I say I'm going to do it, like we're going to do it and we figure it out. And um, I, I think a lot of that really came out of just growing up and, and seeing how hard my mom was working for everything. Oh, isn't that so awesome? I hope your um, mom is listening because it's Mother's Day <laughs> coming up. So It is. It is. <laughs> It's amazing how that, like, that role of mom and, and like, it's sort of been brought to the forefront again in the last year in particular. And just, like, how do we navigate this whole situation and what, you know, if there's kids at home and school and all this stuff. And it's, uh, it's been going on for, you know, forever, but it's just been brought to the forefront again. And, and uh, you know, that's, it's. Yeah, that's very cool to hear, Peter. Yeah, well, and it, it's funny, you know, the with kids in the background and just figuring out how you navigate this. There's been more than one meeting where oh, yeah. I've been I've been on with Arvin and and his. Uh, I think your oldest boy yeah. pops in to frame and <laughs> comes over and looks at the screen and is smiling and being goofy, and then he just runs away. <laughs> only all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. My daughter will come in and she'll point at the screen and she'll say, mommy's working and she slams on the keyboard and then she says, no, 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 goodbye and hangs up. <laughs> Is that what she sees me do? <laughs> okay. Apparently. Monkey see, monkey do. I, I know. <laughs> well, we'll have to interview our kids at one point and see what they would say on the other end of this microphone. <laughs> exactly. So what about you, Arvin? Oh, so I uh, was born and raised in India. I lived there 27 years all my life, went to uh, school, college, and then I came here to the United States in 2010, and uh, it was for work. So mm -hmm. I've been working since 20, uh, 2003 uh, when I graduated. It was pretty clear for us, you know, when I finished um, college, I, I needed to get it to work and you know, <laughs> take care of at least myself. So good experience working in the IT industry, 
my passion for computers started very earlier on, right? And uh, in uh, back in India, I didn't know how it was here. Having access to a dedicated computer 24-7 wasn't a thing back in the day. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so whenever I could get my hands on one, I'll just uh, stay on it as much as I can at school or in uh, one of my relatives' houses or um, my friends who had computers. Then working in the tech industry, you just gain the experience. The biggest thing for me is when you work in tech, uh, you see that certain things are easy for you, but the, but the same things might be a little challenging for your users, right? And uh, it's very rewarding when you're able to help them navigate that. And uh, that, uh, to me, is what really drives me and helps me. Um, that's what I try to do. It's, yeah. it's very rewarding for people like me to know people like you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, I just like using tech to, to mess with my brother growing up. So, you know, <laughs> yes. don't put passwords on our favorite games that he couldn't get in. Oh. <laughs> you know, we are a household of three boys, too. I didn't know you were, too. Uh, yeah, oh. there's, there's three boys. And, um, yeah, I used to mess with my older brother quite a bit because he's not tech savvy. Oh. <laughs> so I'd go in the source code and I'd just put a, a password. I mean... Very, very low rent. You know, this is when I was nine, ten, probably. <laughs> I'd just go in and there'd be a password right there in the source code. But you didn't know how to get into it, so that's I didn't really care. <laughs> and that's, see, that's, that's the difference between people like you and people like me, because that is not low rent, because I don't even know how to find source code. Um, I have a question for you, though, Arvin. So what was it initially that drew you to computers? Was it really like how did they work or what you could do with them? Oh, like what was the... Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting when you start learning computers, it's, uh, it's a little, there is obviously a learning curve like anything else. And then there's a point where you learn certain things. Uh, there's an excitement in learning it entering a command or something, seeing that go through and then <laughs> uh, and then noticing that, wow, I just did that. Right. And um, I guess you just want to do more of it and getting things to work, right? What computers were in the 90s to what it is now, it's a lot different in the sense that um, now things are more um, outcome-based, right? Uh, you you want to be able to do things fast, quickly, from anywhere at any time, right? Um, whereas back um, in the 90s, when I started using computers, you had a command line interface um, and Windows was just catching up at that point. So it, 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 it's really thrilling when, <laughs> when you are in front of a command line. Right? What is a command line? <laughs> oh, that's where you actually have to type to get the computer to do something instead of like move the mouse right. around. Oh, before there were like icons? Oh, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm with you now. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, like you, I live on the command line too, so. <laughs> like right today you do? Uh, I do quite a bit, yeah. Peter probably does today. Today I don't do command line <laughs> so well at all. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, he's very technical with everything that uh, he does in terms of the code and. Yeah, that's really cool. So uh, we've had a couple of um, people on in your industry and Kyle and I have always been curious because um, I have two boys and a girl and they're always um, my oldest is always interested. He's super into video games, but he's getting into like, I want to create my own video games. And Kyle has a daughter and a son and his son is um, similar to my son with, with video games. So if you had advice for the younger kids, like how like what would be a good introduction to coding or to really um, getting into technology that is going to not make our lives more difficult. Because... <laughs> so no putting passwords on like, the fridge or anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> our television or my computer. Yeah. No. There's some great boot camps. And there's even now there's boot camps for, for younger kids, six, eight years old to, to teach uh, code. There's summer camps for it. Oh, wow. I unfortunately can't name any of them off the top of my head, but I do know that they're out there. I would go out and if there's something that you like doing, mm -hmm. you can find a way to to make code to write code that just makes that more interesting or ties into that. Do that. That's how I learned to code. I grew up playing games, tabletop games and everything. Mm -hmm. And and the way that I taught myself code was my boss had come to me and he said, Okay, which ever one of you two, and there was me and one other guy working for him, <laughs> said, Whichever one of you two learns PHP first, like you're 
you're our developer. I'm nice. like, okay. <laughs> so I started, That's I just jumped into it. I'm like, well, I want to do this. So I just created a, a simple application that tied into that hobby. And that's how I taught myself to code. I just had this vision of you, like, giving the other guy a side eye and then, like, running, <laughs> getting books. I don't know. I, I don't know. It, it, well, yeah. I mean, even even then, it was uh, it was a lot of Google. Yeah. I mean, it, it still is. Like, that's that's the, the biggest tool. It, I've, I've really grown kind of beyond books at this point because so many of the books are, are really geared toward how to get started. Right. Mm-hmm. And so at some point, you just go, all right, Google. Somebody else has to have run into this before. Right. Yeah. And uh, Stack Overflow is uh, it's a website that's out there that is huge with the tech community. If you have any problems with programming, like you can find an answer there usually. There's a, a similar one called Server Fault for, for the infrastructure yeah. side. Infrastructure side, okay. So interesting. So, were you going to say something, Arvin? Yeah, just to add to what Peter said for kids, uh, to answer your question, right? There are a couple of really fun things to do for kids, especially to help them motivate. Minecraft, uh, which is a video game, yeah. has a way where you can set up servers and invite uh, uh, your own. I, I don't know if they're doing any of that. Yeah, I think okay. they are. I feel like that. I've heard that server okay. thing before, but I don't know what that means. What does that like? I don't know entirely what what all is possible, (laughs) but I do know uh, that. um, So we have uh, uh, a tech, uh, a senior technical engineer in our team. His son learned coding by setting those up. uh, Oh, and creating the world. uh, And creating the world and things like that. And you can do the same with Roblox is also what I'm hearing. Right, That's another thing that the kids are playing now. My son, who's five years old, he's totally into it. The other item that I that you could do is uh, projects with Raspberry Pis. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you heard of mm-hmm. Raspberry mm-hmm. Pis? Yeah. yeah. These are uh, credit card size small computers uh, that you can purchase for like twenty five thirty dollars. It's basically a computer. It has a HDMI connection. You can plug it into a TV and a keyboard and a mouse, and you have a fully functioning computer. So wow. these are used for and kids can write programs to animate small characters mm. to make a character look like it's rolling around and things like that and it and that type of programming is graphical based so you'll say you'll pick the character you'll say make it jump and you know mm-hmm. so you'll put the uh, sequence of events together and then hit play or something and then the character will do what you programmed it to do oh, which fun. is the very basis of programming right understanding the I think that's that's the fun thing of what what you guys are talking about and that reward that you get from the seeing this thing that I just built do something and work and yes. at, yep. at five years old like and I, I watch it too and it's it's uh, you know I can get as frustrated as any parent of like here get off that screen go outside you know all that stuff but at the same time I'm watching like learning and development and excitement about yeah. I don't want to shut down that excitement if you're yeah. learning something that you think is really cool and you want to yeah. grab onto and learn more that's awesome yeah yeah we're we're doing some similar stuff with uh with my daughter right now and and I mean she's just coming up to two but she she's very interested she wants to be in front of the screen she really hates it when we shut it off <laughs> but we can just see the brain cells dying oh, yeah. when <laughs> when true. she sits there and just zones out mm-hmm. but it's really funny when she comes into my office and sees me sitting there staring at two screens and she's like bat <laughs> it's so wild how drawn we all are to it and before i, I just want to interrupt our conversation because we said we were going to check on something and we're yes. um at the we're already, oh my gosh, time's flying. It's one forty six. <laughs> it's a time check right here. <laughs> All right. So, Peter, you have a dashboard that shows all of the active, correct my language, threats. So they're, they're active cyber attacks that are happening right now. It's a real-time map. I've got it slowed down so I can actually like see the numbers and they don't scroll up so fast. But I'm looking at it, and right now it is sitting at around 42,355,000 so far in, I'm think this is in the past 24 hours so we'll come back to that i'm i want to see what it says you know when we when we start closing up our conversation say that number one more time uh 42 million three hundred and fifty five thousand okay just wanted to make sure i had yeah. all the Just zeros a couple. And, yeah <laughs> um, okay that it, 
In the last 24 hours, yeah. I think. Wow. So, I mean, that's, and I mean, it says today. So that could be since midnight uh, our time. But that's that's still a pretty big number. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yes, I think that's mind boggling. So that's also a good segue into both of your expertise to kind of talk a little bit about your companies. So, Peter, why don't we start with you first? Because I just have a general question. Um, you changed your name recently, right? Yes. Can you just talk to me about what your name is, the meaning, how you got there? I'm just very fascinated and curious. <laughs> well, so um, I really I changed it because I, I wanted something that just spoke more in my voice. What I had was something that I just kind of, I'd come up with it very quickly. It was just off the cuff. And, and it worked fine for, God, eight years, I think. Yeah. Um, and about, um, I guess it was nine years. Jeez. Uh, so yeah, last uh, October, um, I officially relaunched and rebranded my company uh, to Soul Minion Development. So S- Soul spelled S O L. Um, and the the meaning behind that it was is very much a, a play on words. Uh, soul as you know, I I love doing stuff outside. I want, you know, I, I sit and I work at a computer all the time, but I would so love to just be outside and go do stuff. And so soul is just, you know, that seeking the sun. Mm-hmm. Um, the other part of that is soul as in single, the, you know, the lone developer, you know, we all started somewhere. Mm. And so it'd be that you start as that soul person, that, that first person, and then soul as in your soul. Um, you know, I, I, I think I feel like I bring a passion to, to my projects to, you know, I really want my clients to succeed. I really want them to, to move to that next level. And it's, you know, recently we have a a client that I've been working with them for seven years now, uh, ongoing. They have been just trying to continue to grow. And they've, they've done a really good job growing organically. And they are now in the process of, of putting together crowdfunding for uh, SEC level investment through the, wow. the new SEC rules. Oh, wow. So I'm really excited to see uh, what comes out of that. They're, they're working with a company, capital company, crowdfunding platform out of, I think, out of California or uh, San Francisco. I don't remember. Uh, they're, uh, they got, my contact is in Texas, but it's really exciting to see finally getting to that point where he's like, we're going to get some real money to, <laughs> to do a budget and, and really focus on like building out. So it's just taken so long to get to where we are because of budget. Yeah. And there's, there's just limits, but it's, so I really look at, I have that, that passion. I really want them to succeed. And so I really try to make sure that what I'm providing them isn't just functional, but it's scalable. Mm-hmm. And I, I've had to break that to, to more than one person where I take over a project. And I'm like, you know, what you have, you know, the, the developer, they did fine. You know, they created you something for you that was functional, but it's not scalable. Mm. And that's, that's really where I, I try to differentiate myself as, as being something that can, you know, yeah, right now you might only have 100 users or 500 users, but I want you to be able to have 100,000 users all on the platform. Yeah. So. And wait, where did, did I miss it? Where did Minion come from? <laughs> so minion just uh, uh i was the sole minion ah. um there's no employees so uh, soul minion <laughs> oh, I, I love it um good and arvind how about you tell us about your business oh uh, we are cmid uh solutions of tempe and north chandler um we are a national franchise um we have about 240 um, individually owned and operated CMITs. Wow. And uh, we are across the United States. Uh, in the Valley, there's about five uh, other owners as well. Hmm. Um, and uh, we, you know, work uh, in trying to help out each other. The goal is uh, for uh, our company, we provide IT support and services to small and medium businesses. And, um, and so we take care of their servers, their network devices, mm-hmm. um, make sure the right security is in place uh, in terms of antivirus and firewalls, um, just doing the regular maintenance that needs to be done on the computers so that business owners can just focus on what they do best, which is building their business. That's what we want them to focus on and leave the IT headaches to us. 
the Bitcoin requests, emails, and, uh, <laughs> wire transfers. And, <laughs> exactly. And exactly. Peter, sorry, Kyle, did I cut you off Go in ahead. person? Oh, man. Um, I was just going to say, so what is like the, your specific focus of your business? So in general, uh, we've always been a, a software development firm. So we, we help businesses that have something, a uh, program, a process that they want to automate, that they want to build a product that they want to bring to market. Uh, we help them build that. We have, with the pandemic, a lot of people have, have really pulled back from that spending on large software projects, which is completely understandable. Don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And what we've really come come to is people, they shifted and they, they built and they went remote very, very quickly. And there's a lot of people that... They just threw together whatever whatever they could to make it work. And that's there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it was a crisis. You had to figure it out. But now we're, we're at an opportunity where you can step back. Right. And we're really focusing our effort on helping those, those businesses that have maybe put something in place, but to now streamline it mm-hmm. and come up with a cohesive technical strategy around... You know, what processes do they have? What software and systems are they using? What their security is from the software perspective? One of the reasons I really wanted Arvind here was um, there's really two different sides to IT and cybersecurity. There's those physical pieces that that Arvind is dealing with, you know, the, the servers, the infrastructure, the routers, the, uh, and having all the networks and everything else. There's the other side of that where you have all these tools that are software that now they have to be available. But having them available to the people that need them opens up an attack surface for people. There are ways that you can secure those through at least partially uh, the firewalls and and the the hardware side. But you also need to have a security-minded person dealing with the the software and the setup and and kind of the processes on the server. And and that's kind of where the two of us are, um, where we play in kind of the same, same ballpark, but we're... We really have two different focuses. It goes hand in hand. Yeah. So question for you guys is there's about 100 companies under our roofs at Max 6 right now. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about them, it's there's uh, the branding company downstairs and there's the company that's making uh, uh, drinking glasses out of wine bottles. And there's the, you know, the companies and the companies and what they do. To your point, Arvind, they're they're doing what they do best, which is running this company, which provides value by creating whatever they create for their consumers. But this is something that probably doesn't get thought about often enough in, in your guys's view anyways, until, oh crap, something happened and I'm having to do something about it. What, what are types of things, what do we need to be thinking about as business owners ahead of this to be you know, proactive looking at what do I do to be thinking about this before something happens? So, um, how much time do we have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I it it really you use you use the best word uh, proactive, and you want to be proactive about this stuff. You don't want to react to it. Reacting is going to cost you four to five times as much as just putting in some pre- basic preventative measures. And Arvin's got a really good look at just layering it. You want to do things in in little pieces, but it's it's a matter of what processes um, are you training your people because ultimately your people are the ones that are that are doing everything and they're the ones that are being targeted a lot of the attacks they're not coming through breaches they're not you know forcing their way into somebody's servers or or exploiting they're just calling up your employees Mm -hmm. and saying hey i you know there's this problem and and if we don't react right now we're going to lose thousands of dollars and i need i need access right now and they make it into this big emergency and they social engineer their way in yeah, yeah. i would get emails um like kyle and i were sharing yep. like an office and i would get from e- kyle's email hey <laughs> I'm running into trouble. I need you to wire me this money. And I would look at Kyle, who is sitting next to me. And be like, Just twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> oh, what kind of trouble are you in, man? Exactly. Um, and, uh, but right. why that, that has to work, right? Because it, I mean, why else would they, that's, they do That's it? the disappointing part. I w- yeah, that's the sad part. And there is, um, there, the scariest place you can go to on your computer today is your mailbox, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> For more yeah, reasons yeah, than yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because uh, phishing is one of the biggest ways of, uh, uh, biggest attacks out there today, 
right? Followed by ransomware. And then third, followed by crypto jacking. So phishing is basically sending an email either as a known vendor or a bank or a friend trying to get some information or any type of uh, valuable out of you, right? Money or Bitcoins. <laughs> and um, it's scary because it's out there. A lot of people get it. And uh, there are ways to protect yourselves around it. Instead of opening your mailbox to just receiving all your emails, you can put it through a secure uh, security filter, right? There are solutions out there mm-hmm. that you can mount on top of your mailbox, which will filter through these emails so you don't get those type of spams, uh, spam emails, which reduces your exposure as an individual. And uh, to what Peter was saying initially, right? Security must is not a one and done thing, right? And um, we were we always think of it as securing the users through by giving them the right access and only giving the right people the right access to access files. Securing computers, which is either through your antivirus software, spyware, anti-spyware software, and then protecting your computers by encrypting it so that even if your computer is lost or stolen, the data in that doesn't make any sense to anybody without a passcode. Third, you want to protect your network by installing a firewall or something like that so that it separates your internal network with the external internet, right? Mm -hmm. And above all this, you need to train your users as well, right? Train our employees, which is going to be critical because it's uh, so easy to be uh, 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 the hackers are getting really smart, mm-hmm. right? And and they they sound they they know a lot of information that they can use today to sound like the person sitting next to you, <laughs> right? So that's on the infrastructure side. Peter can actually add more on the software that's being built to, and and how from a code level, from uh, as a developer, you know, do you want to touch? Oh, yeah. yeah. One yeah. quick before Peter, because I have a question about mm-hmm. a, something that happened to us yeah. last week or two weeks ago. A vendor. Yeah. yeah. So we were working with a vendor, mm-hmm. um, and it was a large contract. Oh. And we got an email from the vendor. Correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, but it said, "Hey, here's the invoice. We have a new billing process. Absolutely. Can you send it to this?" And it, it passed one level of our checks yeah. because it was we were expecting the invoice. It was for the right exact right amount on their letterhead on every, uh, yep, yep. everything. Yeah. And then um, our our person who processes all of our bills caught it because he has fallen victim to this before and right. was like, "Hey, we should ask some questions. Absolutely, if they want us to wire somewhere different, we need to um, verify." And it was, but how did they get the exact amount? And like, how does that so? Happen? <laughs> The that kind of ties into what is increasingly becoming a problem, and that's supply chain attacks. So, going all the way back to the Target hack in uh, 2014, mm-hmm. I think it was, where you know a bunch of credit card numbers were stolen because mm-hmm. at the point of sale systems mm-hmm. they were skimmed off the point of sale systems. The way that the hackers got in there was they went after an HVAC vendor, and an HVAC vendor had a weak password on their vendor account, and for some unfathomable reason, the vendor, uh, the vendor's account had access through their, with their credentials to the point of sale systems in stores. Yeah. That's how it originally happened. Wow. And that's, so, that's so like why and how? And so the reasoning behind it was largely around, um, thermostats and climate control within the, within the building. So they had this climate control automation. And so the vendor could, could log in and kind of make sure everything was, was running smoothly. And so they would log in. They had access over the networks for that reason. So they had access to manage the climate control systems within target. Yeah. But, uh, um, that's why that what, that's why it goes back to giving the right resources, the right, the right access, right access. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Again, you know, that that goes into that. It's that supply chain. Most likely someone had credentials compromised or somehow data got leaked. That's kind of been a a big thing recently. We've had two major data leaks from Facebook in just the last month. Mm. Uh, The first one, I think, was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and it was 500 million records. That's one of the most recent ones. Just this year, we've had two really major 
issues that have come up. And so one of those is solar winds. And that was they they went after solar winds and they ultimately got into some cybersecurity firms networks as a result. And this was nation state sponsored. So uh, they've tracked it back to, uh, I believe, Russia. And there's a second nation state that I don't think they've identified yet. My money's on China. They got into SolarWinds. They compromised the source code at SolarWinds. And all of this, this source code was then built into tools that was automatically deployed to all of their client servers. And it was network monitoring software. Network monitoring software has global access because it's just at that level. So you have to give it this, this high level access yep. into the network. And this is software that's used by DHS, Department of Homeland Security, the IRS. Um, you know, this makes me want to like go hide in the fetal position <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. So this, like this was, this was a, uh, one of the worst. That's just the first one this year. Um, there was another one where they it was a very sloppy attack, so I don't think it was, um, I think it was intended to just send a statement to uh, that particular community. Um, but the PHP uh, core so- source code repository, and, and so PHP is a programming language. It's been around since uh, the mid-90s. I think 95 was the first year. Um, I began working with it back in 98. It now runs on about 80% of the internet. Huh. So to give to give you an idea, if if this had somehow not been caught, and again it was a really sloppy s- sloppy hack, and if it had not been caught, this could have potentially been deployed on across eighty percent of the internet. I've got this view in my head right now that we hear the headlines, right? Facebook got hacked, five hundred million data points, and we have anecdotally Jen saying, for example, uh, she got an email in quotes from me mm-hmm. that wasn't for me, and yeah. and. This is like spy movie stuff, right? Like yeah. in 10 years, 20 years, we're going to look back at this time and like you guys are like the superheroes, like fight, <laughs> like good and evil. Like there's, I don't know if I go that I mean, far. <laughs> there's, there, there's, there's stuff happening that people don't even understand at right. such a level. And you talked about the, the hackers are getting so much smarter. Right. We, the other side must be getting so much smarter. I mean, that's got to be, if I'm an alien at a million miles over the earth looking down, like this is fascinating times we're in, right? <laughs> Well, so I, I, I think that kind of points out, you know, what, what really needs to happen is you have to respond differently to this. You have all this stuff that's going on that's happening in the background. Most recently, we had two of our biggest tech giants. So you have uh, Microsoft and you have Google. Microsoft had a vulnerability that was uh, reported and verified back in January. They didn't roll out a fix to that, to that problem even after it had been publicly disclosed, disclosed, which means that once it's publicly disclosed, somebody can build a proof of concept to be able to do something and exploit it. They didn't release that first patch until March 2nd. So that's two months. And that's assuming you like update your computer regularly, right? Well, this is in their Microsoft <laughs> Exchange server. Uh, but yes, Microsoft Exchange is their email system. That went unpatched for two months and people exploited it. And it they they still had... Uh, about 60,000 unpatched servers as of March 25th. So that was a month ago. It has not rolled its way out, and people are just being slow to patch. It actually got so bad, because this is, this is considered a national security issue. The FBI went so far as to go and funny. attempt to get a court order to use the, ex- the uh, exploit, use the vulnerability themselves without the knowledge of the server owners to go in and remove the compromised systems, remove the malware. <laughs> Not go in and patch the problem as part of it, but they wanted to do this without the knowledge of the server owners. Wow. And it was, it was really funny because the, the response of a lot of the server owners was, well, I don't want the FBI in there. It's like, well, then patch your servers. <laughs> <laughs> like, keep this stuff up to date. <laughs> but conversely, you had Google. They had a vulnerability that was in uh, Chrome. It was reported on April 20th, and they f- uh, fast-tracked a patch. It was released April 27th. Whoa. Wow. So as a business owner, who keeps up with all of this stuff? Like, so that's Arvin, that's your company, right? So you guys stay lose sleep at night and uh, fix all this uh, stuff. Absolutely. For us. Yeah. And the the goal is it, it cannot be done manually, right? Mm-hmm. You have to get to a level where your systems are a bit automated. They're on a schedule. They're on a schedule where they get 
updates for antiviruses mm. multiple times a day. They get patch updates that are tested and defect free. And those patches need to be installed on these machines once or twice a week. Yeah, w- once a week should be good. Y- you also want to make sure that at the in the event everything fails, you have a good backup, right? <laughs> because if that is going to be your uh, out of jail free card, right? In the event some <laughs> yeah. someone does get into your computer and you are compromised and it is locked out and you're locked out of your own data, then you can just uh, wipe out that computer, restore from a backup and be up and running. Right? Yeah, it, it boils down to have a good maintenance plan yeah. on, on whatever it is. If, if it's, you know, your network and you have a bunch of uh, Windows workstations, have somebody that is remotely managing that, uh, someone like Arvin, and is going in there and patching stuff. If you have custom software or you have a website that needs to be updated on a regular basis, and I'm sorry, websites are software. <laughs> they do need to be updated. You, you can't just, you know, deploy them and be like, okay, I'm done. You have to update that. And having a good maintenance plan means it's going to get updated on a regular basis. So, Peter, I, I have heard in the business community um, when we have people talk about, um, like, IT stuff. And um, I've heard the comment, well, I don't collect credit cards. I don't process credit cards. So I don't need to worry about this stuff. How true or not true is that? So you still need to worry about it because what can happen is if someone compromises your website, let's say it's just a brochure website. It's it's a WordPress site that you got set up. You have been running your business successfully for you know five, six, seven years, whatever. Uh, and it's sitting out there and you've just never updated it. Well, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that are in there and your computer can be turned into a bot. So it can be taken over to where it can actually, uh, your website can then be used to leverage attacks against other servers. And this is generally done for the purposes of DDoS, so distributed denial of service, where you just go and you get a whole bunch of these these, uh, servers that you've compromised that you just leave idle until you have a big enough uh, collection of them. And then you say, okay, eh, I want to take, Google down for the day. And then you just point all of their all of those computers at Google and just hit them. With requests. Yeah. You promised this wasn't gonna be scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said I was gonna try. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> oh, I think my hands are sweaty. Oh my um, goodness. But th- I mean that's that's exactly why you want to make sure that you're you're keeping the stuff up to date. These they they can be used and and this is why the FBI took it so seriously and went so far as to try and get that court order. It is a national security issue. People can take down critical infrastructure. They could use it to go after um, you know, and again, we're about to go into something completely scary. You know, they they could go after uh hit nuclear power plants, they could hit uh water treatment facilities. They did that back in, I think it was December uh, in Florida. And somebody got in through a weekly protected remote management system and kicked up the Our level s- of lie in the, oh, that was going to be in the system, that was going to be dropped into the system. A human caught it. And so they had other processes in place and that's good. But the reality is it shouldn't have been as easy as it was for somebody to get in remotely. They were using weak passwords. They and everybody had the same password. I mean, it was it was just very sloppy from we're, a security standpoint. We're in, we're in interesting times where what we were just talking about. You should have a backup plan if all else fails. We, I mean, these are just like life lessons that should be good regardless of it's a computer or just uh, uh, what am I going to do Absolutely. if everything else falls apart? But yeah. this computer has become an extension of who we are as a, as a person and like, how are they marketed to us? It's a, it's a tool for you to use, but they have, it's, I'm getting a better understanding of they have so much more access to all these other systems and and things going on that, uh, if I, the individual am compromised, that's such a bigger deal that could lead to lie levels coming up or, access to credit cards at, at Target. And it's, I don't think people think about it like that a lot. I think they think about it as an extension of them. This is my computer. It's my thing. I can hold on to it. You can't grab this out of my hands. But little do you know, everything's being grabbed out of your hands uh, behind the screen. You just don't know about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it really comes down to compliance. Um, if you're if you're not doing credit cards, that's fine. Um, but there's still 
you can be leveraged to to have an, to be used as part of an attack. That's part of it. But then there's also the the various compliance uh, requirements that are out there for um, if you're storing health data. If you're processing credit cards, you don't want those those credit cards to even hit your servers. That's part of it. The software can be used for so much more. If it gets compromised, you can be liable. I foresee regulation coming to the software development industry. There have been enough high-profile hacks in the last six, seven years that at some point, Congress is going to say that's enough and they're going to put some form of regulation in place. I don't know what that regulation is going to, what form that's going to take, but I think that at some point it's going to be realistic that I, my company as a software development company is going to have to face regulation from probably the federal level on software quality and basic checks. Mm -hmm. Wow. As you were talking, I was thinking about, um, I, I mean, I think most business owners intellectually understand at least some level of this and they can understand the importance. But how do you get the buy-in of mm. employees to do the things that they're supposed to do? <laughs> I might be asking for a friend or maybe myself. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's a tricky there part. A um, couple of ways you can do that. Um, one, that one thing that you want to do with um, employees is initially provide awareness, right? And uh, um, have some sort of security training for your employees, which is probably required to be completed once a year. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, answer these 10 questions. When you find a badge without a person, what do you do? You return the badge to someone in the office. When you find a person without a badge, what do you do? <laughs> return that person to <laughs> right <laughs> make sure they're escorted or whatever right so physical security technical security cybersecurity um awareness is going to be most important getting that part of their annual appraisals or something like that would be a good idea all in the uh, effort to improve security for the company itself mm -hmm. right what else can you do um, make sure you're aware of what is out there. Educate yourself. Make sure uh, you get the advice. We have financial advisors to tell us, hey, what do I do with my money? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how do I make sure that I retire uh, uh, You know, um, at, at the age of retirement and I don't work my way into 80s? So basic planning goes a long way. Make sure you get a security assessment done. For your software, uh, Peter can do something like that. For us, we can do. Uh, we can come in and take a look at where you are in terms of your security and give you a report on what are the things that that look good. What are the things that can use some improvements? It really comes down to um, culture. You have to have a cult. You have to foster a culture of security exactly. around this stuff. Yeah. Um, you have to get people to to really buy into it and okay. say, you know, this isn't just you know my information. This isn't just a job. Okay. You know, this is this is our customers' information. This is our customers' data. Um, and so you have to foster that culture. Hmm. It really boils down to security is not one person any one person's responsibility. It is everybody's responsibility. Yeah. And that's that's not just at that company. It's just as in general, security is everyone's responsibility. Yeah. There's this line that comes up when you're talking around this, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link. Mm -hmm. And security is um, exactly like that. Yeah. And I think um, like what saved us was that double check system. Yeah. Um, because if we would have just had one part, like one part, we would have been out a lot of money. Well, once yeah. once the first domino fell too, and it was like, well, they had the wrong 800 number on there. Like there was little things all over the place that we could figure it out. But yeah, you're right. These the little checks and balances Excellent. along the way that make sure that uh, if it gets past one person, it's not going to get past the next person Excellent. or the next system or whatever it is. that Exactly. Know. Yeah. And you guys were lucky to have, you know, somebody who, who'd seen it before right. and knew yeah. what to look for. Exactly. And that's where the awareness comes in play. 
They, yeah. learn, they learn the expensive way. And yep. yeah. <laughs> you guys got the benefit of that knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> but to your point, Arvind, I think it is really important to have those conversations, right? To be, to as you're thinking exactly. about all of the different topics that you're talking about with your, your team, to mm-hmm. make sure that you're also bringing in security and, and just like the awareness of what happened to us, like talking, make sure everybody on the team knows about it and to look out for it. And like, what's the latest email, whatever that we're getting, because... Um, I think that's a way a lot of people get in, right? Like you were saying, is through the emails, people clicking mm-hmm. things and, and doing stuff. So just um, back to your point, Peter, of the culture of safety and security and um, bring it through. And and speaking of culture, I can't remember which one of you brought it up in the beginning, but the the nature of these emails that get sent out with the urgency that's mm-hmm. built into them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that hard to pick up the phone and call somebody or turn to somebody exactly. and just just ask exactly. a question exactly it, exactly yeah. and and there's only so far technology itself can go and then process helps you beyond that so the one of the things accounting teams can institute is hey whenever a vendor asks for a change in address uh, change in bank information we are going to call the person that you know from your contact list. Mm -hmm. So you know that's the person you're calling. You're not calling the person's number from the bottom of the email, Mm -hmm. right? And and that is the person you you know you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. FaceTime if you need to (laughs) ask them, did you guys change your details? Do I need to wire the money now to a different account? Right? So on and so forth. Once that's confirmed. So institute such processes where necessary. And often they're on the other side of that saying, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so a personal story, I had a phone call from my credit card company asking me, and this was a couple of months ago, and, and they wanted some information. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. Right. Like, I'm not giving you any information. Because they were asking me for like, they called me, but they wanted my information to, right. to verify yeah. that they were talking to the right person. And I'm like, no, like <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know who you are. Right. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to have to call you back at, at the number on the back of my card. They're like, oh, okay, well, you can call this 800. I'm like, no, I'm not going to give call any number that you give me. Right. I'm going to call the number that I know is going to work, and I'm going to talk to them, and I'm going to verify it. Right. They're like, okay, no, I, I completely understand. And I hung up. Well, when I got a hold of my credit card company, they were like, no, that that was fraudulent. Mm-hmm. That was not us. <laughs> and I heard that text messages are are a big thing right now, like getting the yeah. package yeah. texts. And, and also I got from, who was it? It was from my, either my car loan or my mortgage or somebody saying, hey, I have some details about your account. I'm like, what? And then they're like, oh, well, we need this information before we can tell you. Oh, all through text. And I was like, mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> text message has been an issue for a while. Yeah. Multi-factor authentication. So that's where you get that code text me- texted to you so mm-hmm. that you can log into your bank or whatever. That's okay from a uh, two-factor authentication route, but SMS has been shown to not really be secure. It's very easy to, to fake that or reroute it and that kind of stuff. So if you can do it through like an app or something like that, I use Google Authenticator for mine, mm-hmm. uh, but there's, there's a lot of different ones out there. LastPass has one. Authy, I think, is another one. Uh, YubiKey, I mean, any one of these that generates that that random six-digit code that changes like every 30 seconds mm-hmm. um, is going to be, hands down, a better yeah. choice for security and doing two-factor authentication than a text message. So we are running out of time. And I oh, just, wow. before we completely close, I want to change directions here a little bit and ask a couple of questions that we we always ask at the end of the show. So do a little bit of a lightning round here. And these questions have nothing to do with anything we've been talking about. So (laughs) they're just fun. We're collecting answers and we'll do something with them at some point. But for now, it's to satiate our curiosity. (laughs) Well, I will definitely get to that. Don't don't you worry. (laughs) So the first question is, uh, what is your favorite book of all time? Favorite book of all time or just favorite that we read recently? Or it, can, it doesn't matter. It, it's favorite book of all time. But if that's a difficult one, because often it is, just tell me about a book that you really liked recently. That's fine, too. So favorite book of all time is called The Talismans of Shannara. Uh, it's a Terry Brooks fantasy novel. That one has, has just I, I, that's one of the few books that I've gone back and read multiple times. That, se- that whole series, that was the, the final book in the series, but it was one of my favorites. More recently, um, I've been doing a lot of audiobooks, and um, I actually picked up Just Work 
by Kim Scott. And it's about uh, creating a culture that uh, both fosters inclusivity and enables people to make the decisions that make people feel welcome. Mm. Um, and how you do that. It's, it's, it's really interesting. And her origin story, I, I was listening to it and I just started it and I, I had been listening to it throughout the day. And then that night I was uh, talking to my wife. I'm like, you need to hear this. This is crazy. Mm. And we just sat on the couch and we just had the audio book going and she's just going, oh my God. Wow. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating. I have not finished it yet. Um, but it's, it's been really interesting to just hear kind of some of her perspectives and things. It's, it's pretty interesting. Cool. Nice. Um, so for me, the favorite book of all time is SharePoint for Dummies. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes SharePoint. <laughs> um, I, I think the favorite book of all time is The Intelligent Investor. It's uh, by Ken, uh, Ben Graham. Um, and uh, it was a book that Warren Buffett, um, I think, uh, advises it. I think it's uh, it was written in the uh, 70s or early, uh, late late 60s and then republished in 70s. Um, the, the book that I've recently read, um, so, so a little bit about the intelligent investor, it for me in uh, finance industry was a big, hey, a big opaque glass, an opaque object. I, I, and so reading that book gave me a lot of clarity. What are stocks? What are bonds? And mm. things like that. So I love, I just like to geek out on that. With regards to the book that I recently read is one called First Break All the Rules. It's by the Gallup Press. And uh, the authors, uh, Marcus uh, Buckingham and Kurt Koff, uh, Koffer, they've what they've done is they've really dealt into what successful managers do differently, mm -hmm. right? Today, we live in a workforce where only about 13% of the of workforce are actively engaged, right? What is it that you can do as a manager to change that? And um, it really opened my eyes uh, to a lot of uh, aspects that I wasn't aware of. So for me, I learned a lot. They, uh, it, it talks about how whenever an employee is uh, in the office, they need to know um, what is expected of them to uh, uh, from their work and what type of making sure that they're equipped to do their work properly and things like that. And rating yourself as a manager on all of those aspects that are, there's a 12 question pointer thing in that. So it gives you an understanding of where you are, acts as a guidance to being a better manager. Yeah. I thought that asked, that led me to another question quickly because we know that Peter is a soul minion. So. <laughs> <laughs> but Arvind, um, do you have a team? How big is your team? Um, yes, uh, we have, uh, as I said, five different uh, uh, owners here in the Valley. Uh, I work with two other owners very closely. Our team is about eight of us oh, wow. to, uh, in total. We provide uh, services my individual uh, franchise takes care of Tempe and North Chandler, but uh, CMIT provides service across the valley. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That must be nice to work with other owners too. Oh, definitely. We support. jump on calls every day at about 4.30. Uh, we, <laughs> we are in and seeing how our day went and have like a daily scrum call. Half half uh, <laughs> solving issues and half therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a feeling there's alcohol involved. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, ours are not that exciting. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> We, we, we do do team outings once in a while. I mean, now that things are opening up, we did the first one a few weeks ago. So awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So one last question before we get to your number and wrap up. Um, what is one life lesson you've learned through the pandemic that you want to continue to bring with you um, as we look at the rearview mirror for the pandemic? So what are you going to bring forward? My wife and I had it right when we when we liked the outdoors. Unfortunately, everybody else has now discovered them. So this summer is going to be really interesting. I thought you were going to stop with my wife and I. I was like, well, that's good. Too. All right. All right. And Arvind, how about you? I think we as a society have become so resilient. I think that's a great thing. We as families have not seen each other so close <laughs> in so close proximity for so long mm -hmm. and that 
has had some breakthroughs as well. Um, so I think uh, those are definitely things that have made us stronger as families and as communities. And I think um, m- moving forward, that's something to take forward. Yeah. Awesome. Agreed. All right. So the number we've been all waiting for. <laughs> it is 2.30. So we've had About just 45, 45 minutes. minutes. Wow. So we are at 43,631,000. Mm. So yes. 1.3 million, basically, in the last 45 minutes. Uh, 600, almost 640,000 now, yeah. So yeah. we're at 1. yeah, 1. about 1.3 million yeah. in 45 minutes. Attacks somewhere Attacks. in the world. Yep. That's and this is, I mean, this is phishing, this is exploits, and this is malware. So ransomware, spyware, any, any of it. Um, all three of those categories combined. So... If you're a business owner, leader out there, focus on what you're good at. Read some of these books we just talked about on how you can be a better manager and for all else, call these guys. Yes. <laughs> yes. So speaking of, can you tell us how we can find you online for anybody listening? Sure. I can be found uh, through my company website, uh, soulmanian.com. We've got links to our LinkedIn, email, phone, all that good stuff there. And you can find me on, if you want to, follow, you know, mountain bike pictures and stuff like that. You can find me on Instagram at, uh, at architect, A-R-C-H-I-T-E-C-H 99. You can reach us at our website, which is cmitsolutions.com forward slash Tempe, spelled T-E-M-P-E. You can also give us a call at 602-877-9495. Thank you very much, Peter and Arvind, for being on the show today. It was fascinating. I'm not quite hiding under the desk. Uh, and and <laughs> I see a light forward and, and help. And thank you guys for, for talking about everything. Uh, until next time, we are off to continue building better communities where people and businesses thrive. Thank you for listening to the Future of Work Water Cooler Conversations with your hosts, Jen Burwell and Kyle McIntosh. Each episode shines the spotlight on business leaders who are defining what a healthy and productive workplace looks like in Arizona and beyond. To be part of the conversation, schedule a visit of the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center in Tempe, Arizona, and connect with us at max6.com. Remember to like and subscribe to the Future of Work Water Cooler Conversations on Apple Podcasts.